night before Jesus Christ was uh, crucified, he gathered his disciples together for what we call the Last Supper. And uh, after they had eaten, you know, he'd washed their feet, then they ate, and basically he kicked Judas Iscariot, the one that was going to betray him, kicked him out of the room. So it was just Jesus and the 11 faithful disciples. Jesus started to talk to them about what life was going to be like. And uh, one of the things he said was he was leaving. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that there I am, that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, the only part of that they heard was, I'm leaving. And that disturbed them greatly. And Jesus gave them some comforting words. But the thing that probably is most significant about what Jesus said during that little after-dinner talk the night before he was crucified was he said this. He said, I'm giving you a brand new commandment. A new commandment I'm leaving you. I want you to love one another. Love one another. Can you imagine those 11 people, even though they've, they've already kicked Judas out of the room, those 11 people were probably as different as 11 people possibly could be. Politically, economically, personality. I mean, Jesus said, here's the new commandment. Love one another. And then Jesus said something that is so significant and I think sometimes we forget it. He said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And you know what is true? That happened. That happened. Those 11 people and then the other faithful followers around Jesus over the next couple months they loved one another. And I honestly think that when you trace your, the history of the church, the early church, one of the reasons it had such incredible, explosive growth was because finally there was a group that genuinely, authentically loved one another. I mean that group of parents who all had the kids in that same class, they might like each other, they might click with each other, they might really kind of form a, a nice little fellowship group, but the love that they had one with another was nothing like this. There, there might have been extended families where, you know, there's mom and dad and and lots of siblings and everyone married well and everyone's got nice kids and and that's a an extended family of 20 25 people and they just love getting together for thanksgiving and christmas and all the other things and and it is just like something really special this extended family because it's like everybody loves one another even that didn't compare to the love that that early church had. And I honestly think that one of the reasons the church went from just a few dozen people to thousands of people in the course of just three or four chapters there in the book of Acts is because they were loving one another like Christ had told them. And then you know what happened? I think Satan woke up and he realized you know what, if we, things keep going like this, I'm going to get blown out of the stadium. And we are going to lose big time. And so what did Satan do? You know what Satan did? He said, I got to attack that church, that collection of people, because they're loving to each other too much, and this thing is growing too fast. 
And how can I slow this freight train down? I'm going to start getting them to not love one another. And isn't it interesting that almost every book in the New Testament has as one of its themes loving one another and fixing the problems that exist that keep us from loving one another. It is. I mean, you think through it. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians. I mean, all of them have a couple verses, maybe a couple paragraphs, maybe even a few chapters on how to love one another. It's because it wasn't working anymore. It wasn't happening anymore. And uh, it's like Satan kind of got things going he, he finally got his defense on the field to stop them from scoring goals you know what I'm saying and uh, that's why if you've been in church long enough you've probably heard the old saying to live above with the saints I love that's going to be glory but to live below with the saints I know that's another story. I mean, is that not true? I mean, Bunko, we love each other. We're excited to be together. We all fit. But that group at the church, that, that, those group of pe that group of people that gather in that one room on Sunday mornings, because I think you've really got to look at most of the Bible in terms of local church application. We, we look at church and it's like, huh, I just don't, I just don't mesh with them. I mean, there's, there's two or three people that I'm on the same page with, but church people are weird. And you know what people are thinking about you? They think you're weird. You're different. And, and, and it's like Satan has done a, a, a masterful job of getting us to be suspicious of one another, getting us to be impatient with one another, getting us to be irritating towards one another, getting us to just, quite frankly, not like one another. Why? Because he knows that when we love like Christ called us to love, it is the most dynamic, powerful force on the face of the earth. And Satan has been battling the church and sabotaging that love for 2,000 years. One of the reasons churches, and every church is this way, one of the churches are so dysfunctional. And one of the reasons it's a collection of people that, that you know, really sometimes, let's be honest, struggle to be a group, to really be an extended family. One of the reasons, and maybe the primary reasons, is because it's a spiritual warfare thing. Satan does not want you to like, let alone love, the other people in this room. He doesn't want me to like you, let alone love you. He doesn't want you to like or love me. I mean, that, let's just be honest. We have an enemy. We have, a, we have an enemy who, who realizes he got caught flat-footed. He realizes that if a group of believers really come together and do life together and love each other the way Jesus said to love, I mean, that's nuclear. I mean, that is a power that cannot be reckoned with. And so I find it really interesting that when the Apostle Paul started to talk to us about how we are supposed to respond to the love, or to, excuse me, to the salvation that God has given us, the second thing he talked about was loving one another. 
Now, take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 12, okay? Let me just give you a 30-second catch-up on what we've been doing. For the last couple weeks, we have, have started a series of the practical part of the book of Romans. Romans chapters 1 through 11 are this detailed, exhaustive explanation of how God saved us. And then... In chapter 12, verse 1, he says, therefore, okay, here's how you ought to respond. And he kind of gave this, this overarching principle. He said, in light of the fact that God saved you, you should present yourself as a living sacrifice to him. In other words, you are all in with him. He says, jump, you say, how high? He says, do you say, I'll do it till I, you tell me to stop. I mean, that is the kind of response that all of us should have to the salvation that God has given us. So he says, therefore, present your bodies as a living, holy sacrifice to God. It's just logical in light of what God has done for you. Well, those are the first two verses. It's kind of the overarching principle. And then he starts getting practical and specific. And we saw the first specific last week. He said, in those first few verses, he says, Here's, here, here is a practical, specific thing you should do. If you're going to really and truly be a living sacrifice for God, you should give the body of Christ a full measure of service. And if you remember... He talked about the whole thing of, of spiritual gifts and how all of us are gifted and we all have a way to serve. And, and, and his bottom line was give a full measure in service to the body of Christ. Now, what's interesting is the next topic is this, and I've already introduced it. The next thing he says is I want you to love unhypocritically love without hypocrisy now some of you might uh, catch this and this is, this is kind of an interesting flow of thought do you remember uh, you know he's talked about spiritual gifts there in that first paragraph verses 3 through 8 and now he talks about loving one another if you think about the book of 1 Corinthians where he really talks about spiritual gifts what does he do there? 1 Corinthians 12 is all about spiritual gifts. And then what is chapter 13 about? That's the famous love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, love is this, love is that. God didn't have Paul put that in there just so some people would have something to read at a wedding, okay? Here's the deal. Those spiritual gifts, this ministry that we have towards one another, it is nothing if there ain't no love. In fact, the main way to neutralize any giftedness you have, any benefit the body might get from your service, the main way to neutralize it is for that service to happen without love. I mean, I could be the greatest teacher in the world but if you don't perceive that I love you, you could care less. You, you could, we, we could have someone here that is the greatest exhorter, encourager. You know, they can work the lobby like nobody's business. They can make any politician embarrassed at, at their skills. But you know what? If you don't perceive that that person trying to encourage you loves you, to heck with them. Without love, all of those gifts are nothing that's what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. That's why the love chapter is there. Without love, who cares that you're an apostle, prophet, preacher, teacher, exhorter, giver, and all those other gifts? Love's got to be without hypocrisy. So look at, look at uh, what he does here. Because this is kind of exhaustive and... Uh, and uh, a little hard to, uh, to get, but essentially what Paul does is he gives this main point, let love be without hypocrisy, and he goes on to talk about this and, and uh, 
hating this and clinging to that. And then, starting at verse 10, it's, it's just like rapid fire. Boom, 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 boom. Be devoted to one another. Give preference to one another. Honor one another. Not lagging behind in diligence with one another. Serve one another. Rejoice in hope. Perseverance in this. Be devoted to prayer. Contributing the needs. Bless, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's almost like he, if I counted them right, there's like 13 things. And every one of them could be a sermon. But I think what happens is, is in reality, we can kind of categorize them and what he goes on to talk about is initially he's talking about how we're supposed to love hypocritically and in these first few verses which is what we're going to look at today it's here's loving unhypocritically within the church within the local body of Christ and then the second half of it transitions to outside the church you know in the neighborhood in the workplace, in the public square. So let's just look at this thing for a little bit. Initially, what he's going to talk about here is loving unhypocritically the people in this room. Because remember, I, I, I tried to make this point last week, and I, I think it is so valid. Most of the instructions in the Bible about how we are to function with other believers are not how do I function with the other members of the 250 churches of Texarkana, Texas, and the other 150 of Texarkana, Arkansas. He's saying, how do I get along with the 150 people of Fellowship Bible Church? The people who are sitting just 15 feet away from me, three rows up, four chairs over. How do I get along with them? How do, that, that when he says serve one another, love one another, bear one another's burdens, he's talking locally. See, he wasn't writing to 15 churches in Rome and he hoped they all got a copy of his letter. He was probably writing to a group of people that were about our size. And you know what he said to them in verse 9? Look at it. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. Inside this church, in this little collection of people, this spiritual extended family, Paul is telling us to love each other unhypocritically. Let love be without hypocrisy. This is verse 9. Now, you probably know this, but it's a good review. Uh, there's actually several verses in the Greek language, or several words in the Greek language that could be translated love. Three primary ones. And kind of an easy way to remember them is there's like the love I have for Vicky, that's eros love. We get the word erotic from it. That's husband and wife love, or what should be husband and wife love, okay? Then there's philos. That's the brotherly love. That's the love I have for my brothers and my sister, for other friends. Philos, eros, philos. The third word, and this is the word that's used here, is agape. Or if it's in the verb form, it's agapao. It, 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 you know what it is? Okay, if, if eros is the love I have for my wife, and philos is the love I have for my brothers. You know what agape love is? It's the love I have for my grandchildren. You know, I never knew this. I remember talking to a friend about 10 years ago, and they had just had their first grandchild. And, uh, you know, Alexander wasn't born. She's our oldest grandchild. She's nine now. But I remember this guy, and, you know, he's Ph.D., super theologian, all this stuff, teaches at Dallas Seminary, a guy named Ramesh Richard. We actually had him here to speak once. And they had just had their first grandchild. And I mean, he was so giddy, he and his wife. They just could not, that grandchild, I don't think had ever even touched the floor because they were holding him all the time. They, 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 they brought him to this special event that was going on in Dallas that we were there. And, and I'm like, 
this is amazing. These people are just goo goo over this baby. That's kind of real quick summary, but that's grandparent love. And I think if, if, if you wanted a, 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 a human example of what agape love is, it's that grandparent love. It's the love we should have for our children, and we, for the most part, do, but we know them so well, and we get mad at them, and we've got these unrealistic expectations because we're living our life in them, and those things get messed up there sometimes. I mean, it should be that way. But boy, with a grandchild, hey, they can do no wrong. We love them, and we will bend over backwards for them, and we can be as exhausted as can be and our kid will call up and say hey we'd like to go out can you watch the kids tonight and we're like oh yeah bring them on you know we ain't got anything going call them up and tell them we ain't coming you know I mean it, it, it's like that's that's the love that God has for us it's this unconditional love and Paul is saying that's the kind of love we should have towards one another there's an unconditional love element it it sees the flaws but it loves anyway and it and it never runs out you know that it, today it's so easy to say i am so done with that person i'm done with that i'm forget it i'm done with them agapa o love never says i'm done it finds inside of itself because it's rooted in God this unconditional persevering love it's the kind of this is the kind of love that Paul calls us husbands to have for our wife in Ephesians 5 and what notice back here in verse 9 Paul says let love let that agapao love agape love be without hypocrisy and you know, I sat and I thought about that. What, what exactly was he saying? He's saying, I want you to love so genuine and so authentically that you don't have to fake it. I, I want it really to truly be from the heart. And, and all of us should probably know this by now that, that the world has a warped sense of what love is I mean in our mind if you listen to our culture love is just this pit that we fall into I fell in love and it must be a bottomless pit or a pit that defies gravity because then sometimes we fall out of it and I've never quite figured that up but I guess if your world gets turned upside down you can fall out of it but it's not love particularly agapao love agape love is this love that has made a commitment that follows through with actions and and disciplines an attitude of love and you say well where are the feelings well you know what human nature is if you're doing the actions with the right attitude your feelings will follow human nature also says if you're waiting for the feelings it probably ain't ever going to happen. I never feel like getting up and doing the dishes. I never feel like getting out there and mowing the lawn. I never feel like, you know, calling and saying, hey, can I run by the grocery store and pick up a few things? I mean, we just don't feel those things regularly. But when we do those things, and when we love intentionally, I mean, I think the way God has wired us up, when we do the right actions with the right attitudes, those feelings actually do follow. And so I do feel like getting up and doing the dishes or going to the grocery store or folding the laundry or anything else that I might do as an act of service or an act of love to my spouse. That's what agape love is. And what Paul is here saying is, man, let's work towards loving each other without having to fake it because you, you, you can spot fake love so easily I mean I can tell people you know are just faking it you know oh so wonderful and you know it's just you tolerate it but an unbeliever sees that and says I'd rather have bunko 
I'd rather have PTA. I'd rather have the soccer association. I'd rather get together with the folks from work after, after work. I'll find any group, but I don't want to be part of that group, these people that are just faking it. Now, what does Paul do? Like I said, now, he, he just goes through and, 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 and starts listing these things. And from verses 10 down to verse 13, which is all we're going to look at today, I think there's 13 things he mentioned. But as I looked at him, it's like the first couple and the last couple seem to be outside stuff and the middle six or seven seem to be inside stuff so let's kind of look at it that way oh excuse me I, 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 I went too fast here I want, I want to go back here to verse 9 okay look at this let love be without hypocrisy and, and, and what that looks like is abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good abhorring what is evil, hating what is evil, and clinging to what is good. Now, what specifically is he talking about here? You know, we, we can say, man, I, I hate pornography, I hate immorality, I hate bad government, I hate, you know, this and this and this. Yeah, those are things we should hate. But remember, what is he talking about here? He's talking about tight relationships loving one another the people in this room and I think when he says hate what is evil he's not talking about me hating pornography or me hating bad government or me hating you know false teaching he's saying Richard hate that thing inside of you or that thing inside of someone else that is keeping you from really and truly loving one another. Yeah, he's for hating all those other things, but that's not what he's talking about. That's not what the topic is. Hate what is evil. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Richard, you need to hate that element inside of you that gets threatened and wants to prove himself and wants to exalt himself and wants to, you know put someone else down so it makes you look a little better who wants to hold that person at a distance because you don't want them to get to know you too well because then they'll find out who you really are like or that you really are not as whatever there is inside every one of us isn't there there's inside every one of us a little wall that we don't want to let people in we don't even want to let our spouse in there because if they really found out what we were like they may not think as well of us. And, and quite frankly, most of the time, that little wall is kind of an evil wall because it's like we're, we're hanging on to something in pride. We're, we're, uh, we're just, you know, going to keep our stance. And I think that what he's saying there is if you really and genuinely want to love unhypocritically, you need to get one of the attitudes right, and that is hate that thing inside of you, hate that thing inside of that other person that, that really and truly comes because we're born in sin, we're totally depraved, we have a deceitful heart, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful, it's desperately wicked, who can know it? Hate that thing inside of me that wants to keep you at a distance, that wants to keep you from, from not getting to know me as well as you probably need to get to know me so that you can see all of me and really know me well. That's what he's saying to hate. And he says, cling to what's good. You know what's good in me? Nothing. What's good in me is that I've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus got, what a deal. Jesus got all my sin, I got all his righteousness. And you need to love and cling to the fact that I'm a righteous person. Not because I'm a good guy, a good father, a good, I almost said good mother, good uh, whatever I am. You need to cling and love what God has done in my life. And I need to do that with you. And see, if you sit and think about these interpersonal relationships that we have, if we would start recognizing that that 
the enemy is not that person. It, the enemy is that sin that all of us struggle with. Hate that and love the, the righteousness, the new creation that God has made us into. I mean, we're all broken people, but we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're, we're functioning, trying to be a, members of the same body. And so Paul says, get, get it right in your head. So if you really want to love unhypocritically, man, hate that thing inside of you that keeps shoving people away that keeps putting on a facade so that other people think really well of you, that, that, that occasionally lies to make yourself look better than you really are. Hate that. Cling to the, what's good inside of you, and what's good inside of you is what Jesus Christ has done inside of you. He made you into a new creation. Old things passed away, new things came. So then, verse 10 down to verse 13, and we can deal with these pretty quickly here. Because what he says in verses 11 and 12, it, it, it's just rapid fire succession, but it, it's kind of like all these internal things. And like I said, every one of these could have been a sermon. Look at verse 11. And, and remember, keep in mind, the real application, the first line application is relationships within the local body of Christ within this room don't lag behind in diligence I mean if, if God has laid it upon your heart to do something for someone to reach out to someone to, to, to say something to someone that, that would encourage them or help them get to it be fervent in spirit. I mean, sit and, and recognize the value of what's going on in here. Remember, you're serving the Lord. You're not serving me. You're not serving someone else. When, you, when, when you're doing something within this body, you're serving God. You know, I mean, every once in a while, someone will have done something. You know, they fixed something here at the church. They've done something with the yard. They've taught a class. They've worked in Awana. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they'll say something to me that indicates that they did it for me. And I'm like, you didn't do it for me. You didn't do it for Andy. You didn't do it for Megan. I taught that class for Megan. You didn't teach a class for Megan. You're teaching a class for God. You're doing that for Jesus. You're picking up trash for Jesus. You're fixing that door for Jesus. You're serving the Lord. Look at, look at verse 12. Uh, 12. Again, the, the real context, the real topic of the day is these local relationships within the church. You're rejoicing in help, in hope. Man, I am so happy that someday Richard will not be so dysfunctional. <laughs> there is hope. And you're going to persevere in tribulation. Boy, if anything ought to be underlined and, and put with an explanation point, because what do we do? We run away from conflicts in relationships. I mean, a little rough patch, and we're done with that person. We don't want to work through it. But let's face it, I don't care whether it's a marriage or a, a brother-sister relationship or parent-child relationship. The deepest relationships are those relationships where you've worked through the tribulations of life. You didn't run away from them. You were patient in them. And boy, you prayed a whole bunch. You were devoted to prayer. Go back to verse 10 and verse 13. This is kind of stuff on the outside. You're devoted to one another in brotherly love. You're, you're giving preference to one another in honor. I mean, real interesting expression there, but I don't have time to explain it to you. But, but what is he saying? He's saying this ought to be family. There ought to be an Honoring of one another. Look down at verse 13. It's contributing to the needs of the saints. It's practicing hospitality. It's doing for others 
what needs to be done. It's giving to them. And that whole thing of practicing hospitality, it's inviting them in to, to, to your most private areas, materially. I mean, it's having them in your home. It, it, it's saying, you know what, this is mine, but I'm going to share with you. I mean, again, we could talk a whole bunch about it. But what is he saying here? Really, all he's been saying in this first little section is that if we are truly going to be the body of Christ and we're going to respond to the salvation that God has given us, in the same way we're going to give a full measure of service, verses 3 to 8, we're going to love each other unhypocritically. And, and we recognize that there's going to be tribulations, we recognize there's going to be challenges, but we're going to work through those things. I, I'm going to honor, I'm going to give preference, I'm going to make that a priority. Because what often happens, what often happens is, is in a relationship that, that looks like it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, it's just so easy to separate away from it. I just, don't, I just don't talk to them. I just don't do life with them. And funny thing that happens is God seems to constantly drift us back together and we're having to deal with them. And over the course of time, we, we, we develop some really good skills of how to keep that wall there and fake it. And Paul said it shouldn't have to be that way. This, this love that is supposed to occur within the body of Christ that has the potential to demonstrate to the world the power of God like it, early, like it did in the very beginning. By this, you'll know, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. You've loved one another. Well, that's what Paul's calling us to here. That's what Paul's calling us to. Let's pray. We've kind of rushed through these verses. But the real message is what Jesus said in John 13. He's given us a new commandment, and that commandment is that we should love one another. We don't need to fake it. We need to have the discipline and the fortitude to push through. And I think that maybe first in applying this is recognizing that this is spiritual warfare. And so maybe the first thing you need to think about is that uh, maybe you've played into Satan's hand. Maybe uh, relationships that should be better, a bit more intimate or close, friendly. Maybe you've uh, taken the easy escape because you believe the lie of Satan and You've done what the world says. You're just done with it. You've started to fake it. Is there someone that you're in relationship with that that's really what it tr is? You're just kind of faking it? I think we need to each talk with the Lord and ask him to help us to love one another like Christ called us to. Help us to understand with passion how hungry the world is for those kinds of relationships and how really and truly God could use those to draw people to himself.
Maybe there's someone this week that you need to uh, start reaching out to. Giving them a second chance. Asking them to give you a second chance. Maybe you need to adjust your schedule a little bit so that you've actually got time to be diligent and give some service. Father, what we've talked about today, it's probably incredibly convicting to all of us. It's so easy just to come to church and get it done with, head home, hang out with the people we like and avoid the people that maybe are a little rougher. Father, it ought not to be that way. Father, I pray that we would love one another uh, and that we would do it without hypocrisy. We wouldn't fake it. I pray, Father, you'd give us the wisdom to be able to hate uh, the evil, that persistent evil that's in all of us still, Father. We're saved, but uh, we still have that old sin nature. And so we're threatened and defensive and distant when we shouldn't be. Father, help in uh, each of us to, to love and cling to the fact that uh, you, who began a good work in us, are going to keep working, and you'll complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. Father, today I uh, just pray that um, your word truly would be, would have been a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, and that it would be something that uh, has been hidden in our heart and keeping us from sin. We don't want to disobey your word in this area. And so we pray, Father, that uh, this gathering of a bunch of beat up, broken sinners that have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that we really and truly would be a house, a home, a family that loves each other genuinely and authentically. There'd be healing here. There'd be reconciliation here. Father, we pray that uh, there'd be miracles here broken relationships brought back together. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.